Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Developing a Proper Worldview. Uh, this is episode number 64. Um, I think so, uh, my, my uh, uh, numbering system got messed up somehow. When I look at the, the videos I have on YouTube, it says there's 65. Um, but there's only 64 videos shown. I think maybe one of them got blocked or something. So I don't know. We're, we're going to go with number 64. Um, so we just wrapped up Freedom to Fascism, uh, Aaron Russo's documentary, which is one of my all-time favorites. Um, if, I, if I had to recommend three documentaries to a person, it would be uh, Loose Change, um, the second edition, which we're going to get to here. Um, that might even be next after the one we're doing now. Um, and then Freedom to Fascism. And then probably the uh, Megiddo uh, series that we did, the 1 and 2 Megiddo series. So um, that Freedom to Fascism is one of my favorite. It's just very, very thorough. Um, everything's documented. He has interviews with um, senators like Ron Paul, uh, former IRS agents, so on and so forth. So it's, it's, it's very thorough, um, very enlightening. It was one of the first ones I ever watched that really just made me go, wow. You know, they're, they're, uh, things are not what they seem to be. Um, but now we're, we're going to get into um, G. Edward Griffin's uh, collectivist conspiracy. And G. Edward Griffin is probably the most intelligent man that I've ever heard speak uh, when it comes to issues like this. Um, he's just very well-researched, um, very sophisticated, um, he just he is a, he, he speaks very well um, he, he's just he's one of my personal heroes so anything you can find by this guy I recommend watching um, which we've actually when I go through my list of documentaries we're, we're skipping a series of his uh, called hidden agenda it's a six-part documentary um, it's basically it focuses on communism and so I felt like we, we should skip that because um, really like, like when you look at right-left paradigms, um, whether that be fascism on the right or, or corporatism, and then um, communism, socialism on the left, they're really two arms of the same bird, or two, two wings of the same bird. If, same with the, the whole right-left, uh, conservative, liberal, Democrat, Republican paradigm in America. Um, they all work under the same management system. It's, it's just two, two different managing parties, two different operating systems um, under the same New World Order umbrella. They all go through the same political science classes in school. Um, they're all taught uh, collectivism, which is what G. Edward Griffin is going to expose um, in this documentary that we're going to watch. So when, when something really z zooms in on a particular branch of this system, um, I feel like it, it, it's not necessary for us to go through to, to see the overarching plan because we're, we're getting the we're looking at the, the the head of the system not not the lower branches of it um, whether it's uh, it's whether it's um, socialism communism or fascism um, it's it's the same managing part it's the same overseer it's it's new world order philosophy like they all agree that there needs to be uh, centralized power. They all agree in controlling money, controlling resources, um, controlling populations. And so it doesn't really matter which way they come at it. it it's um, basically they're just, it's rhetoric. It causes division, gets people to focus on, it gives an illusion of choice is what it does. It causes people to divide into tribal groups and, and to pick a side. And when you do that, then that other side becomes your enemy, and you never realize that it's all under the same umbrella. Um, I, I mean, it's always shocking to me that you can have people in America that have been around, um, they, they, they've lived through Kennedy, they've lived through um, Nixon, they've lived through Ford, they've lived through uh, Johnson, they've lived through um, Reagan and, and Bush and Clinton and, and Bush Jr., and Obama and Trump, Republicans, Democrats, they've lived through all that all, and nothing has ever changed. Like, like the course of America hasn't, it doesn't matter who's in power. We still have a very aggressive foreign policy. We're still um, 
erasing morality in America um, and, and marching towards this new world order system. It doesn't matter who's who's president or or who you elect senators or or whatever because they they're all they all agree on the philosophy of the American Empire. They all agree on new world order. Um, so then they, they they disagree on on issues um, like like abortion or gay marriage or or um, uh, inflation percentages or you know things like that but when it comes to world policy in the American Empire they're in agreement and so um, I recommend you go and watch that hidden agenda series on your own um, just so you can be more enlightened but but we're looking at the the overall world view not the specific branches of this world view so um, there's also the um, oh, what the heck's the name of it? it? So there's the Hidden Agenda series. It's a six-part series by by G. Edward Griffin, and then there's also a two-part documentary just called Agenda, Agenda One and Agenda Two. I can't remember who does that, but that's worth checking out as well. And then there's uh, another one called There's No Place Like Utopia. Um, those are all we've divided up my worldview series into sections. We we did the gospel. And then we did uh, exposing evolution, and then we're looking at part three now, the American Empire, and those documentaries that I just mentioned would fall in this third section. That, that's how I have them organized in my in my CD files or whatever. But um, so on your own, I, I, I recommend that you go and watch those. But we're gonna skip through them and we're gonna jump into this collectivist conspiracy because G. Edward Griffin explains how there is no right left, there is no communism, fascism. That's all, it's all illusion. What there really is is just collectivism and individualism. And collectivism is um, what, what our politicians will call democracy. It's, 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 it's a, uh, 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 the masses controlled by a centralized power. Whereas individualism is what America was supposed to be with the constitutional republic that guarantees inalienable rights for every single individual. Um, your rights, as outlined in the Constitution, were supposed to be guaranteed regardless of what the mob says. So that if you want to speak out for your religion, you want to print books about your religion, you want to gather together, um, freedom of speech, freedom of press, freedom of religion, right to bear arms, these things, no matter what the mob said, no matter what the masses said, if 99.9% .9 of the populace said, uh, no, nah, you can't practice that religion, it doesn't matter. You have inalienable rights guaranteed in the Constitution that cannot be taken. But that has, over time, uh, through collectivism, through through this push for new world order, that, that's been eroded and erased, and we're being turned into this mob mentality. We're being turned into this collectivist society um, where, where um, might makes right, where you're no longer, the, the minority is no longer protected and so that's what the new world order system is going to look like and collectivism um it is it can be a monarchy it can be an emperor it can be um a, a democracy it can be socialism it can be communism it can be fascism whatever it is there there's an authority an oligarchy there there's a there's an authoritarian power that sits over with centralized power that decides um which rights people have so this the authoritarian power dictates to the society that that's uh, collectivism. Individualism uh, is you're protected from centralized power. You're protected from authoritarianism, and so um, that's what this doc documentary is really going to get into. And this will wrap up um, our part three, and then uh, Lord willing, we'll jump into part four next time. Um, but I think. Uh, by way of introduction, we're ready to go. Um, if you just happen to be catching this randomly, uh, these are done in, in a particular order. So, so I highly recommend that you go back and, and watch from the beginning. Um, don't just jump in in the middle of it, but um, I think we're, we're ready to go. All right, so uh, let's jump into this here.
I'm Ed Griffin. I'm a writer. I write um, controversial works. I think they're very important works. I deal with such topics as uh, banking history, uh, health issues, um, the United Nations, U.S. foreign policy, kind of topics where people get all heated up because they had strong opinions. But I consider myself to be a, a researcher and uh, I try to be a historian as best I can. So I deal with facts, mostly not in uh, opinions. Um, I've been doing this most of my adult life. I started uh, becoming interested in issues of this nature uh, in 1959. And by 1960, I was really revved up to it. I so, I forgot where I'm looking here, here's the camera. Um, just real quick, he said he's been doing this since 1959, that's crazy. Um, but there's, you can find on YouTube, um, it's even in black and white, he, he gives a speech. Um, it's kind of just, uh, it looks like it's in a really casual uh, setting, like he's in a library or something, just talking to people, um, you know, who have an interest in this type of thing. But he, he, it's probably from like the 60s. Uh, try to find that because it's kind of mind-blowing that even back then like the topics he's talking about are relevant today like it's 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 shocking um you, you just have to see it like 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 i say find everything you can on this guy and watch it um he's got books um creature from jekyll island which is an expose of the federal reserve banking system um i haven't read it yet it's on my shelf i've watched uh him give speeches about it and then uh, he's, I think he's also got one on B-17, um, which is a natural um, cure for cancer. Not, not necessarily cure, but um, remedy for or treatment for cancer or preventative measure for cancer uh, that big pharmaceutical companies try to cover up. Um, Again, I, I haven't read that book. I think it's on my shelf. I've, I've watched documentaries about it, though. And I've actually heard other people talk about it as well. Um, you can get that vitamin in the seeds of fruit. Like, um, oh, what the heck is it? Uh, is it plum, plum seeds or, or peach, peach seeds? Whichever one has that hard shell in the middle, if you crack that open, there's a seed in it. It's a really bitter tasting seed, but it's it's packed full of uh, B17, and then also apple seeds uh, have it as well. So uh, if you get like organic apples, eat the core of the apple; it's really good for you. Left my employment with a large insurance company and went in full time in doing writing and and speaking on these topics. The growth of the Tea Party movement and the left right paradigm—they're all sort of intertwined, and yet there are very separate intellectual threads that need to be followed in all of that. I think first of all it's important to talk about and understand this left-right paradigm. What is this all about? Most of us, including myself for certain, uh, in my younger years I was brought up um, thinking that you had to choose, uh, if you were smart at least, you would have to choose uh, politically between being on the right or the left. You had to have a political view and I thought that in those days, I thought that the extreme right would be something like fascism or Nazism. And on the extreme left, of course, you would have communism or socialism, just a little bit short of that. And so that was, that was the paradigm that uh, I was taught and it seemed to make sense at the time. But as I became more involved in these issues and, and learned more about them, I began to realize that the basic philosophy between the so-called extreme left people on communists and socialists and the so-called philosophy on the right of the fascists and the Nazis was really the same. How can this be? They're supposed to be opposites of each other. And then I began to realize that there is something more common to all of these philosophies that was left out of my training and education. And that was the ideology of collectivism began to realize that the thing that was common to them all is something called collectivism. Now that's a word that um, is not very well used. It's not very uh, entrenched in the uh, vocabulary of most people today. But I found out that it was a very commonly used word about a century ago. People wrote a lot about collectivism and the opposite of that would be individualism. Those are two words that are sort of uh, abandoned today. But in my view, I think they need to be uh, 
recaptured and uh, understood and used more. And I realized that communism and fascism, the so-called opposites, are merely variants of collectivism. They're the same thing. And they believe that the group is more important. By the way, um, prisonplanet.tv is Alex Jones, um, one of his websites uh, from Infowars, which is uh, right here. Um, I can't credit Alex Jones enough for enlightening me. Um, through stuff like this, throughout, we're, we're going to watch some of his documentaries, 9-11 Road to Tyranny, really opened my eyes, The Fall of the Republic, uh, The Obama Deception. Um, I recommend watching all of his documentaries first before you check out his, um, he does a live show on Infowars, um, I think every day, um, a four hour live show from like 11 to 4 Central Standard Time, um, but he can, a lot of people can't, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, his, his approach, his aggressive extremism, um, extremisms, it's extreme to a lot of people. It's not palatable for a lot of people. It's, it's too abrupt, too aggressive, too in your face. And when you listen to his radio show, radio show he'll dump so much knowledge on you in a short span of time. And a lot of it is upper level type stuff that'll just make you go, this dude's out of his mind. You know, stuff will sound crazy. That's why we're doing developing a proper worldview. I feel like you have to, you have to lay a foundation. You have to have an understanding before you can start to get into some of this higher conspiracy type stuff. Otherwise, it just sounds so fanatical and so crazy and so insane um, that you're just, you're, you're left going, what? That, that can't be true. But when you, when you come along and you understand um, from a biblical worldview, and then you, you, which we're doing here, we're, we're laying the groundwork, then you, when, you, when you'll have an understanding so these higher level things make sense because you're able to compute it, you're able to compartmentalize it, you're able to, to put it in its proper lane. Uh, but when you just jump into it, and 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 it's and it's he's very he's a very angry man um scripture says um to not have anything to do with an angry man uh because it'll make you angry as well and this is very true um anytime i spend any length of time listening to jones i find myself getting furious at the world you know just because it's he, he's telling you the truth about what's going on and 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 the severity of it and the 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 criminality of what new world order people are doing and you're just left going where is justice you know let these people need to be held accountable you, you, you end up getting furious so you have to take it in sound bites i think and his documentaries because he, he in a documentary he comes across you know it's research and he's calm and he just presents the facts in his radio show he's just firing cannons you know just boom just firing everything he's got trying to trying to get this information out there and i understand that so um i would say just be cautious with that I, I would say watch his documentaries taste some of his show i think i think he got wrapped up in the whole trump thing way too much and 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 um you know for that matter so did i for a little while you know when when somebody comes along speaking the right kind of rhetoric you think okay here's a guy that's on our side but and then you realize wait he's just another puppet under the same system um so that part is kind of discouraging he used to have a man that did a morning show um every every day called david knight um david knight um rejected the whole trump thing and so him and alex kind of had uh irreconcilable differences of opinion on that and so David Knight went his own separate way and he does his own show. Uh, very much more calm. I, I think David Knight's a brother in the faith. I don't know him personally, so I can't judge his fruit. But when he speaks about the scriptures, um, I find that his, his exegesis is correct, that he's understanding the scriptures correctly. 
and to me that that's an indication that he he um you know um he, he has the spirit if, if he's understanding spiritual matters correctly so i recommend you listen to the david knight uh, the the David Knight show. Um, I don't know where you can find him. Uh, when when social media started banning everybody, he was one of the first ones to go. Um, so I'm not really sure what his website is, but but um, the David Knight show. If you can find him on your apps, I bet you um, the Apple Podcasts app probably doesn't carry it because they banned a lot of stuff. But um, Rumble. If you go to Rumble, you can find the David Knight show. I know that. Um, but. I recommend listening to him first before you jump into the Alex Jones stuff. Um, like I say, Alex Jones just watched the documentaries, which I think you can still find on PrisonPlanet.tv if, if that website's still around. Um, if not, Infowars.com. Um, go to their store. You can find their documentaries. His stuff is almost impossible to find on YouTube now because they did it. You know, they purged all that nonsense. Um, I don't know if it's on Rumble. I would bet it's on Rumble, but. Um, like I say, we're, we're going to watch a lot of that stuff as well, but um, I'm thankful that, that Jones is out there and that because of him, I, I was introduced to people like Officer Jack McClam and, and G. Edward Griffin and David Knight and, and so on and so forth. Important than the individual, for example. And the individual must be sacrificed, if necessary, for the greater good of the greater number. They believe that the state should be all-powerful and that uh, the people should obey the state for the greater good of the greater number and all of that sort of thing. Um, they believe that rights are uh, granted by the state. They're not, uh, they're not part of the human being. They're not, they're not God-given. They're not entrenched in his body and soul. They have to be granted by the state. All of these things, and you look at them one by one, communists and fascists and Nazis and socialists, they all believe that. So wherein lies the conflict, you see, and I began to question that. And I realized that it's partly a trick. It's a, in fact, I think it's a huge trick. It's a great scam because people even today are thinking that they have to choose between the right or the left, not realizing that no matter which way they go, they've accepted basically the same ideology underneath. Now it's true that the leaders of these groups like the, the Stalins of the world and the Adolf Hitlers of the world and the Mao Tse Tungs of the world and so forth, the, the leaders of these groups on left and right will fight each other and they will go to war with each other and there will be tremendous battles as we saw in World War II, for example. Uh, but what are they fighting over? Ideology? Not at all, because they agree on ideology. What they're fighting over is dominance. Who it and it's interesting the bankers will fund both sides because the new world order system doesn't really care who comes out on top in a conflict like that they're still going to have their way you know they're just going to have it through a different managing system so when you look at world war ii both sides were funded by the world banks um that is the new world order system you know just kind of watch sit back and watch and it's two managers fight against each other not really caring the outcome saying, well, whichever way wins, we'll just go that route to get to the new world order. Is going to rule. That's all they're fighting over. And once you get that picture, historically, it's not too difficult to see that that's the same thing going on even today. It's certainly going on in American politics. We have the left versus the right sort of embodied today in the Republican Party supposedly on the right and the Democrat Party supposedly on the left. Now here's a choice, isn't there? Well, why is it if this is such a choice that we go from Republicans to Democrats and then four years or eight years later we go back to, to Republicans again and we keep doing this. We've been doing this since World War I. How come the country keeps moving in the same direction all the time, Amen. deeper and deeper and deeper into collectivism? regardless of which party is in in favor because they both believe in collectivism they so uh, i apologize for pausing there but under republicans supposed conservatives like like bush we got the um uh, patriot act which uh was an attack on constitutional freedoms the terrorism act um under um trump you had the push for mandated back and it was pushed even further under Biden so it doesn't matter and and then when you look at like foreign wars foreign aggression um, just it, it doesn't matter who's in power whether it was Obama or Bush we were still fighting wars in the Middle East we're still uh, fighting to spread democracy 
Um, so it, it and and morality is on a decline no matter who's in office. Uh, Trump called himself the most pro-gay president ever. Um, so it doesn't matter if they're Republican or Democrat. Both believe in big government. Their slogans are different. Their leaders are different. But the poor voter out there trying to make sense of all this is uh, he's tricked. He's stuck. He's trapped. And so this is the, the important thing to, uh, I think, understand that this left-right paradigm is a, uh, it's a political ploy. It works very well for those who know what they're doing. We find that the Republican Party and the Democrat Party both are pretty much in the, the hands of a, of a relatively small group of people with a membership of about 4,000. It's called the Council on Foreign Relations. These are the people that are really pulling the strings in both the Republican and the Democrat Party. And they've even written about it. There's a fellow by the name of Carol Quigley, who's a former history professor at uh, Georgetown University. Uh, by the way, he um, was the mentor of uh, William Clinton when Clinton was a student there. And, um, and he wrote several books about uh, this group of people and their origins and their roots coming from Europe and England in particular. And uh, he comes to a very interesting point in one of his books where he says, okay, this is the way the real world is. He said, how is it that we collectivists, we elitists, how can we rule the world when at the same time we want to let the average person think that they're living in a, quote, democracy. They're living in a system where their vote counts. They're living in, in this world in which they feel that they must participate in their own political destiny. This is a carefully nurtured myth that they want to create so people will be content with no matter what happens to them, they'll say, well, I voted for it, or I did it. This government is my government. No matter how bad it is, it's, it's responsible to me. And as long as people have that image, then they don't complain so much about how bad it gets because they did it, they think. So Quigley deals with this question, how do you let people think that they're directing their own political destiny when at the same time we, the elite, we are the ones who must direct their political destiny without them knowing it. How do you do that? And he answers the question brilliantly. He said, it's very simple. You've got to have two major political parties, and they'll both have the same major goals, the same basic fundamental principles, and they'll argue with each other uh, on, uh, on the surface with slogans and leadership and style and all of that sort of thing. He said, but we will control them both. There's the strategy. There's the whole scam behind this left-right paradigm. When you understand this history and this reality, you look at it and you say, well, yes, we've got a left wing and a right wing, but they're just opposite wings of the same ugly bird. And that bird... It's, I'm a fan of professional wrestling, so I think that really helped me understand this because in professional wrestling, you have a guy that comes out and he pretends to be a good guy you know he gives the rah-rah speech gets the fans behind him says all that stuff and then you have a guy come out and he's the antagonist he says all the negative things that makes the crowd hate him and then they fight each other and, and, and there's a winner and a loser and so on and so forth but behind the scenes there's a writer what in wrestling is called a booker who's determining Who's gonna win? Who's the bad? He determines who the good guy is, who the bad guy is. You go out, you say this. You go out, you say that, and and he determines who's gonna win, and so on and so forth. So the booker is the pow the one in power, and the fans are presented good guy, bad guy, and they choose somebody to cheer for and somebody to root against. Um, but it's all controlled by the booker, and that that's the same thing with politics. You have left, right, Republican, Democrat behind the scenes. The New World Order system, the 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 thirteen families, the 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 banking system, the banking elite through through their controlling managers the, in America, the Council on Foreign Relations, um, their managers are are um, implementing their policies, and and whether it's Republican or Democrat, they're taking orders from the CFR, they're taking orders from the bankers, they're taking orders from the New World Order system. It's, it's pro wrestling. It is called collectivism. So how does that apply to the Tea Party movement that we see today? There it is, I mean, that's the blueprint. The Tea Party movement seems to have been a very genuine, spontaneous uh, movement 
arising from uh, people who were unhappy with both the Bush administration and the candidacy of Obama. They didn't like either one of them. They were people who understood more or less, maybe not intellectually and historically, but that there was collectivism in both parties, but they understood that something wasn't right and they didn't want more of the same. And so the Tea Party movement, you know, based, just think about it, what does that mean? It goes back to the historical episode where the uh, colonists in Boston dumped the Tea Party into the in Boston Bay because it was a protest against the taxes. They huh. Theorizing here, but he's going to explain how the Tea Party movement was taken over by, by uh, what we would call rhinos, uh, the, the Republicans in name only, the, the, the Republican system, the right arm of this New World Order system, saw this grassroots movement of discontent spring up called the Tea Party movement, uh, which I think like brought Ron Paul into the, to, to the mix. Um, which is the only true politician I've ever seen. He speaks the truth. Um, but they, they saw this happening and they said, how can we control this? Um, we see people are discontent and, and, and unhappy. We can't have a third party. So they infiltrated it, took it over. And I think they used that to then say, okay, so they, they want an alternative, we'll give them Trump. And so they brought, I, like, again, this is just theorizing, but I think that's, like, they took over that party. They took over that movement, seeing people don't want just another politician. They want Trump. Brought Trump into power, used him as a scapegoat to just dump all the media hate on him to say, see, this don't work. We, this, this system don't work. Um, but controlled it. So they diluted the, the, the uprising of the people by taking over. And then, and then pretending like they're giving us an alternative, but it's really just all the, some of the same. I don't know if any of that makes sense. I'm just theorizing here. And the uh, restriction of liberties and the Stamp Act and so forth on the part of Great Britain against the colonies. And so the Tea Party movement really was a rebellion against big government. No matter what camp it came from, whether it came from the Republicans or the Democrats, well, it didn't take long, uh, especially when the Tea Party movement began to gain momentum, and uh, I was privileged to see that because I was invited to participate in some of these early events. And I remember the first event I went to, uh, maybe they had a couple of hundred people, uh, but they were all, you know, dedicated to the principles that made this country great. It had nothing to do with Republicans or Democrats, it had to do with political philosophy, uh, the concept of limited government and the people being in charge, not the government in charge. So I saw it start in a small fashion like that. And then over the next couple of years, it grew and grew and grew until finally it was a very large movement. And at this point, the uh, political parties, the leadership of the political parties began to take very careful note of it. And they said, wait a minute, this is, this is something we should be doing because they're experts at orchestrating uh, movements and letting the people think that it's their movement, you see. This was a genuine grassroots spontaneous movement. It had nothing to do in the beginning with political parties. Well, the, the leadership of the parties couldn't let that be, so they both looked at it very carefully, and the, the Democrats decided that because of the, uh, the nature and the slogans and so forth, that didn't fit well. So they began to attack it. They began to try and make it look like it was a bunch of uh, uh, idiots and wackos and tin hat people and all this sort of thing. And the Republicans thought, hmm, this is something we can use. And so they started to go into it as best they could and take it over. That was their goal, to copt it for their, uh, for their program. And well, so here we are today looking at this process underway. They're still trying very hard to convert the Tea Party movement into a Republican front. And I'm sorry to say that they have achieved some success in that direction, primarily because of um, some very well-known people who are closely aligned with the Republican Party. Uh, we're talking about uh, the candidate, of course, Sarah Palin, who is a Republican from top to bottom, and she represents this right-wing image. She fills the bill perfectly. She's, uh, she's the Miss Republican right-wing collectivist. And uh, she can speak with great uh, uh, fervor and great emotion and great, uh, and great meaning against the extremes of the Democrats, those le bad left-wingers. And she does a good job of it. And everything she says is true. 
But she doesn't speak out against those bad right-wingers, you see, because she's part of that group. Her mission is not to bring about a restoration of the principles of America, but to get the Republicans back into power. That's her mission. And of course, we have people like Glenn Beck, who have the power of, of the Fox broadcasting system behind him. That's tremendous power. And he's always speaking against those bad left-wing Democrats with great conviction and great fervor and great truth. Nothing wrong with what he says. What's wrong is what he doesn't say. He'll never uh, attack a, a somebody from the Republican Party. We've got people like Rush Limbaugh, plays the same role. He's very good at exposing the Democrats. He's very good at uh, pointing out the absurdity of the left-wing philosophy, but he'll never say anything bad about a right-winger or a, a Republican. So there you have it. Of course, on the Democrat side, you've got the same the same team, you know, this is, these are the cheerleaders and, and the players, they work together. And the average voter gets caught in the middle of this. He hasn't any idea what's going on. He just thinks that the debate is, is such that he has to choose. What are you, who are you going to vote for? Are you going to vote Republican or are you going to vote Democrat? And so as long as they're in that role, they're like a, like a tennis ball in a uh, tennis match. They get hit back and forth across the net. First they're on the right, bing, then they're back on the left, bing, back they're on the right. They're Republican, they're Democrat. And the game goes on and on and on. And although it's possible for the players of that game to win, the, the tennis ball never wins that game. So I think it's time for people to stop being tennis balls in this game and, and just get out of the game completely. There are certain issues that people on the left and the right in American politics will never discuss. And the reason they won't discuss them is because they agree mutually. The Democrats and the Republicans agree on something, so they don't want to talk about it in public debate because it reveals the fact that they're basically the same. They only talk about things on which they disagree. Turns out that the things on which they agree are the most important things things in which they disagree are relatively minor. So the things in which they agree are, for example, our foreign policy. They both agree that the desired goal eventually is to move the United States into world government. Not just any world government, but a world government based on the model of collectivism. In other words, big, powerful, centralized world government. If it were a world government based on the principles of freedom and uh, freedom of choice, freedom of culture, low intervention, if no intervention in the lives of normal human beings, it might be a wonderful thing, but that's not the kind of world government the left and the right have in mind. They're talking about total world government with all major decisions being made at the top and people at the bottom being essentially fu uh, in, living in a feudalist society, this serfs. Uh, and uh, peasants, basically, in a high-tech feudalism. And the left and the right both agree with that goal, and so they never discuss it in public debate. Another thing in which they agree is the dominance of the banking system in our economy and, to a large extent, in our politics. They both agree that the banks are supreme, that the banks must be protected, that the banks must be funded, they must be bailed out, they must not be allowed to fail. When the banks make bad loans to third world countries or if they make bad loans to large corporations, both the Republicans and the Democrats agree that we must come in with taxpayers' money, either tax money or inflation money, and we must bail out the banks. And we do that, they both agree, by giving the money to these corporations and giving the money to the third world countries so that they can continue to make interest payments to the banks. So those are two major issues, I would say perhaps the, the largest issues we could possibly face. And um, so we find that Republicans and Democrats um, are in agreement on that. You might add one third, another third uh, topic if you wish, and that is our, our role in the Middle East. Um, they both, both parties talk uh, alternately about, oh, uh, we've got to end this war in, uh, in the Middle East, pull our troops home, you know, and all that sort of thing. But that's just rhetoric. You notice we go from one party to the other. The war continues, the war grows, the funding continues. So there we have three major issues, perhaps the three largest issues of all. And there's no debate between Republicans and, Democrat, and Democrats as to what to do. Though there may be some debate in rhetoric, they may give speeches, but when it's time to vote in Congress, 
There is no division between them at all. And this, this itself should be the biggest giveaway uh, as to what the reality of politics is today. If anybody has got their eyes open, they ought to be able to see it just by examining those three issues. I do believe that when um, Ron Paul uh, ran for president and to everyone's amazement achieved such great support in spite of the roadblocks that were put in front of him and in spite of the total disinterest on the part of the major media so that he was uh, practically unknown to large segments of the people. Parenthetically, I would say that if the media had given Ron Paul anywhere near the same exposure they gave to the Republican and Democrat, I mean the, tr the old style Republican and Democrat party candidates, uh, I think he probably would have been elected. But Except for they control the voting machines. They're never going to let somebody into power that they don't want to be in power. Anyway, um, that was sort of a phenomenal event that somebody who did not have the endorsement of the establishment and who spoke so clearly on issues, uh, the very issues that we were talking about, the issues of the, the war, the issues of the economy and, the, and bailing out the banks and the Federal Reserve System and the issue of national sovereignty. These are issues that mainstream Republicans and Democrats don't want to touch because they agree on that. Ron Paul disagreed with what the Republican and Democrat Party were doing on that and so he spoke about it. And the fact that in spite of the fact that he was the only one talking about these issues, he got so much support tells me that there is a, a latent power, there's a latent awareness on the, part of, on the part of the American people just waiting to be tapped. I think those who are cr controlling the two-party system are very much afraid of that. They don't want that to be tapped. And that's why they are working so hard now to put controls on the internet mm -hmm. because the message that Ron Paul was delivering was prime. We had a golden period from like 2000 to 2015, where we had uh, free knowledge, where the internet was wide open and people could learn. But now they're clamping down on that and through censorship, through algorithms that don't allow you to search for certain things, that block certain things. Um, you say certain words on, on Twitter or YouTube, you get blocked, you get banned. You try to search for certain things, you can't find it. They're clamping down on that free information, free knowledge thing that we had. We had that window there, uh, but that window is being closed, being taken over the same way they took over uh, radio and television. Primarily delivered over the internet, not through the major channels of communication. So now we see uh, almost daily efforts on the part of the mainstream political figures to concoct different ways and different reasons and different excuses for putting controls on the internet. They're going to license people so that you can't even have a blog, they say, unless you have a license from the government. They want to put filters on the search engine so that you can't even look up certain words and things like that. Actually, I think what they're trying to do here in this country is pretty much imitate what they're already doing in China, for example. They, they really admire that system in China. Our own figures here in this country, although they may you know, speak with scorn about a closed society in China, they're doing everything they can to imitate it. So that's one of the realities we have to look at. So what does this mean for the future? I think that as long as the internet can be kept open and free, it, it uh, bodes very well for us because I think we do have at last a chance to get around the mainstream media. But I think that if the governments of the world, and particularly in our own government, if they're successful in putting legal restrictions on and clamping down on the internet, I'm afraid that the, the um, chances of, a, of a, um, a maverick moving against the establishment become very, very small indeed. And then windows closed. I believe that um, getting a man in the White House is not as important as it would seem at first. In fact, I think it's almost uh, counterproductive because as long as we focus on getting a man in the White House, there's the underlying assumption that that's all we need to do. Americans are of that nature. They want quick, simple solutions to problems. They want to know who you're going to vote for. That's it. Because they think that the, they can discharge their responsibility of citizenship by going to the polls every two years and maybe spending 20 minutes and 
putting a little mark on a piece of paper and walk out and say, okay, I've done my job. I've, uh, I've defended my country. It doesn't work that way. Because by the time you go to the polls and you put your pencil mark on the paper or punch the lever, whatever you do, the decisions are already made. The candidates have already been selected. And the work goes on there, is who selects the candidates that the people vote for? Who frames the issues that the people vote for? Voting is nothing. It's, it's all done before that stage. So as long as people think of, in terms of who are we going to vote for? What man are we going to get into the White House? They're looking in the wrong direction. They, they don't realize the scope of the problem. So. I'm not saying we shouldn't have the right man in the White House. That could be very important. What I am saying is that the task is much bigger than that. People need to become active in politics. They need to become active in their communities and in disseminating information and helping to create public opinion and awareness on the issues so that it would be possible for the right man to be elected. Right now, you know, uh, Ron Paul um, probably would have more support if people understood more about the Federal Reserve System. When he started to speak about it early in his campaign, most people were saying, huh, what's all that about? But because of the internet and because of the distribution of so much material on the Federal Reserve System, including my, my book, which probably played a small part in that, there was a substantial number of people who did understand that, hey, wait a minute, the Federal Reserve System isn't a government agency, it's a cartel, it's a banking cartel, and it's working against the public interest. So there was, when there was enough people that could say that and understand what they were talking about, all of a sudden the momentum began to move toward Ron Paul instead of away from him. Yes, people still said, I don't know what he's talking about. But more and more people were saying, I do know what he's talking about, and he's right on target. And you reach a critical mass with that. When enough people start saying, yes, yes, he's right, then the others who don't know anything are listening say, what are they talking about? And now they take an interest. So I think that we're almost at the point now of this tipping point or the critical mass where people do understand the scam behind the Federal Reserve System. I think if Ron Paul and other candidates would just continue, continue emphasizing this issue alone, I think it could make the difference. It could be the difference between recapturing the country and not doing so. Back to the old line political figures in the Republican Party, it is true. When you compare that with Obama, Obama came to power uh, riding this crest of beautiful rhetoric about change and making a difference and taking America back and all of that sort of thing. And people responded to it emotionally. And that was, that was it. There was no substance, but it sounded good. And they were mad. They were mad at the present uh, regime. They didn't like the Bush administration. They were angry. So anybody that spoke about change, well, that was their man, right? Okay, here we are. Another cycle is passing and people are now mad but this time, they're mad at the Obama administration. So the same political trick is being played again, but this time on the part of the Republican Party. The Republican candidates now are issuing great emotional, heartwarming statements about loving their country and restoring the Constitution, taking our country back, bringing about change, reducing government, and so forth. And you look at who is saying these things. I mean, people like Newt. Gingrich, for example. If you look at his voting career, he voted against the Constitution more often than not throughout his whole political career. He's great at giving speeches. He uses all the right trigger words and phrases. But here, here's a guy talking about taking back the Constitution when he himself has been one of the great attackers of the Constitution by his votes in Congress. So it's come to the point where people have to stop listening to the rhetoric and start looking at the actual voting record of these people. I don't care whether it's Republican or Democrat, that's not the issue. Uh, it was Lenin who said it so well. Lenin said, words are one thing, actions another. Of course, when Lenin wrote that, what he was telling his followers is that tell them what they want to hear. Don't worry about 
telling a lie. They want to hear lies, he said. Words are one thing. Tell them what they want to hear. Get elected. Come to power. When you're in power, he said, then do what you want to do. Words are one thing. Actions another. So he was advocating lying. Well, believe me, professional politicians understand this same technique. They would never come out and advocate it in public. They'd, they'd uh, deny it. But look at their records. Don't listen to their words. Look at their actions, and then you'll know what kind of a game they're playing with us. Every politician I've ever, ever seen in my life, they issue all this beautiful rhetoric while they're running, saying they're going to do this, this, and this. They get in office, and they do the opposite. They do none of what they said. And everybody just kind of, it's always shocking to me how everybody just is like, oh, like, like, think about Trump. Trump had me excited talking about putting Hillary in jail, holding her accountable for what she had done, you know, building the wall, all this stuff. And people say, oh, he couldn't get it done. You know, come on. It's it's all rhetoric, man. They're, they're, it's it's just all nonsense, man. It's all it's all a game, you know. We You got to look past that and say, all right, the whole system is corrupt. The, the entire system is broke. It doesn't matter, wi matter which manager you put into position because they're just going to follow the edic edicts of the New World Order. The whole system's broke. Um, and th there's no fixing it because it, it, it's, it's, it's prophesied. You know, it, it's going to happen. Um, but we don't know the Lord's timetable. You know, if enough people become aware, perhaps the Lord can cause a delay and we can enjoy our freedoms for a little bit longer. Uh, you know, we don't know what the Lord's timing is, but it's a broke system. Well, both Republicans and Democrats, both left-wingers and right-wingers, uh, use this tactic of um, trying to discredit uh, their opposition. And they're very good at it. And uh, they know that if you come to the point where there is a serious debate underway about a, a serious issue, the best thing is back away from the debate, stay away from the issues, because they will lose. So they start attacking their opponent's character or their intelligence, or they try and look for something in their past to make them seem like they're uh, evil people. And it's, it's called demonizing. You demonize the opposition. This is an old tactic that's been going on for a long, long time. And uh, yes, I, I've seen it uh, uh, over the years um, where they have uh, tr taken a group like the John Burt Society and uh, which is just an educational organization, but it, it was an educational organization dealing with principles and real historical facts. And they pretty well succeeded in convincing everybody in America that the, the Birchers were a bunch of, uh, uh, at the, the least, they were a bunch of little old ladies in tennis shoes, but at worst, they were a bunch of Nazis and fascists and racists, and they were even called communists. And so it didn't make any difference. You just call them some name. And if you keep doing that often enough, and in major channels of communication, most people will believe it. So that's a tactic that's uh, well used, and I think we have to be alert to it. Also, we have to be alert to the fact that the people that we're talking about, these, these elitists, it's hard to find a better word, but the, the ones who want to really control this international collectivist government, um, they are not dumb. They have a lot of money, and they have think tanks that work out strategies. And one of the strategies they have always used is to lead their own opposition. And they try to lead their own opposition because, they, first of all, they know there's going to be opposition, so why wait around? Why wait around for real opposition to develop if you know it's going to happen? Send your own people out there and let them pretend to be your opposition, and everybody will follow them, especially if they're well-funded. And if they give the right speeches and say the right words, you know, those nice, those nice um, the campaign speeches, for example. Uh, so, but they're really controlled by the very people they're speaking against. I came across that when I was doing research for the Federal Reserve System, because I realized that in the early days, the very bankers who put together this cartel and drafted the Federal Reserve Act, it was their bill. When it came time to promote it to the public, they funded um, and actually delivered their own opposition. Some of these bankers went forth and started giving speak, speeches and interviews to newspaper um, reporters saying, oh, this bill is bad. It's bad for America. It's going gonna, it's gonna to damage uh, the economy. And they knew 
that the average person reading that in the newspaper would say, oh my, my goodness, Maud, listen to this. These bankers don't like the Federal Reserve Act very much. Hmm, must be, must be pretty good, you know? So they play this game. So we know that this is still going on today. And for example, in the Tea Party movement, if, um, if they want to discredit it, if they can't control it, okay, let's say if one of the parties can't control it, they'll have to discredit it. So they will, and I believe already have attempted, to send people into the Tea Party movement who are real wackos or pretend to be real wackos. Or if they're real wackos out there, they make sure that they're brought in to the Tea Party movement. And every time there's a media crew going out there with their cameras taking pictures, do they take pictures of the, uh, you know, the 10,000 uh, middle class Americans who know what they're talking about? Or do they pick the two or three wackos over here with the tinfoil hats? Or, or the guys with the swastikas on their arm and so forth. That's where they focus, you see. And I believe that some of those people are probably sent in there on purpose, just to demonize and discredit the movement. Now, this is hard for most mm, Americans to, to believe, because they don't realize that this is really hardball. This political game is hardball, and they don't realize that it is a game that there are professionals playing it. It's a matter of historical record that the, the group of people that sometimes we call capitalists, the big, super wealthy families, you know, the, the Rothschilds, the Rockefellers, and the heads of the big corporations in America, AT&T, Ford Motor Company, and so forth, uh, people think of them as the super capitalists. It's a historical fact that many of these people have provided the funding, the essential funding to help bring it to power uh, regimes uh, such as Hitler's regime that was well funded by American uh, financiers and British and um, also in communist Russia the uh, the group there the Lenin the Leninist group was well funded by American and London bankers and so it's tempting to say well they um, they created their own opposition and I think that's partially true, but I wouldn't go that far. I think what these people do is they look around and they see what kind of native uh, opposition is out there and or what kind of native groups are growing, movements are growing that they really want to control. Maybe they don't necessarily create them, but they see which ones are coming to the front, and those are the ones they move into. And if you have enough money, you know, millions and millions of dollars, it's not too difficult to gain influence over almost any new group that's struggling against its opposition and looking for money. So they've played this game. They played it in, um, in both um, the Soviet Union and in Nazi Germany. I think they're doing the same thing in America. I think that's one of the things going on now with the Tea Party movement. Uh, they don't think they create. I don't think they created it at all, but they see it as something that has the potential of being a powerful movement, and so they are putting their best attention and a lot of money into it to see if they can't capture it for their own uses. Another. All right, we're going to pause right there. Um, we'll pick up um, here next time. Okay, so that's what I got for you guys tonight. Um, not going to do much of a, a wrap up here. Um, I guess I, I don't have a lot to say. I, I said it all during the video, but um, again, check out everything you can by G. Edward Griffin. Uh, his books, his videos, get it while you can. Uh, the dude's a genius and has a lot of great stuff. So, um, As always, I appreciate you guys watching. I love you, and Lord willing, we'll talk to you next time.